Good afternoon and welcome to the Gresham Technologies PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Ian Manucha, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Super, Alessandro. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for your interest in the company and your support of it. Um, so you'll hear from me and, and also from Tom Mullen, um, our, our CFO. Um, fairly whistle-stop tour through the first half. I'll, I'll start just by giving you all a quick recap of who we are and what we do. Um, we'll then work through um, our financial model. We'll look at uh, key operational highlights of the first half. Um, we'll do a little recap on our platform, our technology, and why it's so special and why customers are investing in it. Um, and, and then beyond that, we'll um, look at the second half and uh, how we feel about that, which is, I have to say, hugely positive. Um, so we've had a pretty good first half. Um, we're very well placed for the full year. Um, and the team is pretty upbeat, actually. So starting off with Gresham as a glance, um, we are a provider of technology to financial markets, and we provide control and automation solutions. Um, and the purpose of our engagement with customers is to help them digitize their operations and give them complete confidence in their data and their day-to-day -day processing. Um, and in good times and in bad times, this is a key area of investment for financial institutions. Um, so let's talk briefly about our platform, first of all. Um, we're an enterprise grade, bank grade, software as a service platform. In other words, we run in the cloud. And essentially what we do is we help financial in institutions connect to, to reconcile, in other words, match and identify and manage exceptions, and then control the flow of data around their businesses. Um, and we do that with any and all forms of data. And that's a key differentiator for us in the market. So I'll, a little later on, try to bring that all to life for you. Um, we're clearly headquartered here in London. Our development center is uh, in, in large part in Bristol. Uh, and then we have offices around the world that we've been building out over the last 10 years or so, uh, most notably out in New York, um, in the financial centers addressing the large market that exists in, in the Americas. Uh, incredible team, um, 200 employees around the world uh, in nine offices, very motivated, high levels of engagement, uh, and, and I think a strong and ambitious management team uh, and a good track record of investing in our people and building leadership skills and a great track record of acquiring and integrating and building a common culture around the world. Um, our customers, some fantastic brand names, um, a very short list of key customers here, but, but you know, over 275 approaching 300 customers around the world, you know, in large part, blue chip, well-known financial institutions on the buy side, on the sell side um, of capital markets, um, in energy and commodities, in insurance, um, and in banking, retail banking and payments. Um, fantastic list of customers. We do great things for them. We've got very high customer satisfaction scores, um, and we do win awards. The, the awards that we choose to go after are those awards that have a strong customer endorsement element to them. And in the first half of the year, we've already notched up some very, very strong awards, as you can see there. Um, in, in terms of where we're headed, uh, we're about building annualized recurring revenue, sticky recurring revenue. Um, and the line of business that is most important to our future and now constitutes the core of our business is clarity. And that's been growing strongly now for um, nearly 10 years since we started that business. And our growth strategy is around landing uh, into key customers, 
expanding and growing within customers, cross-selling and then opening up new markets internationally. Good track record of doing that. We opened up the US in 2015. We invested in continental Europe um, three years later. We've opened up in Asia Pacific. Um, so international growth, we've got a good track record of opening up new industry sectors. We started off in banking. We opened up investment management. We've opened up energy trading. Uh, we've got repeatable wins in insurance um, and a strong track record around product innovation and a strong track record around our M&A journey. So that's, that's us at a glance. Um, thinking now more concretely about the first half, really interesting first half. If you think about our market as being in large part financial markets, um, you know, then we've had a veritable storm for a short period, um, you know, really kicked off with the collapse of SVB in the spring um, and then the uh, acceleration of interest rates in markets around the world. So it's been a challenging first half, um, but actually we've performed in line with our plan. We did see a slight slowdown of transaction flow um, for a short period um, as firms uh, came to terms with the new dynamic in the market. Um, but actually, we had a very strong June. Uh, we've had a very positive July um, and a good pipeline moving forward. So, you know, where we stand today, revenues and margins are in line with our plans for the full year. Um, in fact, we've got 95% um, revenue visibility. That's contracted, highly visible revenues at the end of the half year for our full year group revenue numbers. In the first half, we signed five new names, um, three in the States, two in Europe. Um, and um, from our installed base, um, a growing installed base that give us regular upgrades as they adopt and consume more software, we saw 16 incremental upgrade contracts. Um, so, you know, growth in our install base, additions of new names um, on track for the full year. Also in the first half, we've uh, invested in some key leadership hires, uh, most notably uh, Dan over leading our U.S. business, um, U.S. sales business, um, and Geneva joining to lead as our CMO um, on a global uh, remit. Um, already making an impact and very excited about, um, you know, the, the, the strengthened leadership team we have in the business. Um, in the first half, also, we went live with a new product in our joint development customer. And I'll touch a little bit more on that later on as we prepare for launch in the second half. So pretty exciting first half externally in the market, given the challenges that our customers were facing. Um, but also very positive for us in that we, we landed at the end of the first half on plan. Yeah, just, just now to touch on, on, on our financial model, more, more, uh, more, more in particular, the Clarity financial model. So Clarity is a reminder is high growth, high margin, has sticky recurring revenues, uh, so software as a service business. Um, that Clarity business has grown to be 75% out of our group revenues. The Clarity gross margin is growing, um, grew to 86% in the first half from 85% in the previous year. Clarity ARR on a five-year organic uh, compound annual growth rate has grown 23% or 36% once we take into account our m &A activity. Actually, that ARR, to prove its stickiness and so on, has an improving net retention rate of 103%. Uh, that's up from 102% of the full year. And we're confident we can raise that rate further in the second half. That Clarity ARR it, and, and the size of the Clarity business is now at a scale where it's driving improvements to our group cash EBITDA margins. And we can see them improving period on period that in turn is driving through to free, improvements in free cash flow. So that's the financial model. Now to look a little bit more at the uh, first half financial results in particular. 
So headlines and some of these Ian has, Ian has touched on to, to a certain degree, but we're continuing to see double digit clarity growth and we're, we're well positioned for our full year, full year expectations. Clarity revenue growth, and that's including both the recurring portion and non-recurring portion, is at 10% or 11% or growth on a constant currency basis. That's against the first half of 2022. Group revenue growth of 4% or 5% on a, on a constant currency basis. So that includes the non-clarity re revenues, the non-strategic business. The, the way to think about that is it is it until clarity became cash generative, generative, it funded clarity for its, its first decade of life. Forward-looking clarity ARR growth, 10% or 12% on a constant currency basis. So again, strong growth over that last year, despite the period of uh, macroeconomic uncertainty. All margins remain broadly consistent with the first half of the previous year, despite a number of headwinds. We've landed on cash with cash at the 3.8 million at the end of the first half, which is in line with expectations. Um, free cash flows continuing to grow. And that is, of course, after taking into account the 4.8 million US dollar payment contingent consideration in the second half of 2022 in relation to our acquisition of Electra in 2021. As Ian mentioned, we've got really high visibility of our group contract, of our group revenue number for the year. Under contract, we've all already got certainty of 95% of those revenues as at the half year. We're expecting significant margin improvement in the second half, which is aligned with the traditional second half weighting of, of, of the clarity business. And we've also, we've also got a really solid pipeline of new opportunities, just really giving us confidence that uh, that 5% that gap can, can absolutely be met um, and our full year expectations will be met. So our most important metric, that clarity forward looking ARR number. Um, the left-hand side of this chart is, is, is very much looking at half on half clarity ARR numbers on, a, on an actual currency basis. We previously mentioned the five-year ARR CAGR of 32% or 23% when on an organic basis once we strip out the impact of, of, of M&A. There's obviously been significant FX impact over the most recent six-month period, which is identified on the, on the left-hand side there with, with the um, seemingly uh, 2 million increase in the second half last year, dropping to a, a 0.5 million increase in the first half this year. However, when, once we strip out the impact of FX and look at this on a constant currency basis, which is shown on the right-hand side of this chart, we can see that actually the underlying constant currency growth is very consistent, 1.1 million, 1.2 million, 1.1 million, um, despite that period of, of, of macro market uncertainty. And the, the pipeline and improving market conditions, as Ian has described, really give confidence in us lifting that growth rate in the second half. So now to see how that clarity business and the growth of it is continuing to group, build on group cash positivity. So this is looking at uh, clarity revenues on the left-hand side on a trailing 12-month basis, but at six-month intervals. And we've done that because the, the, the clarity business is second half weighted traditionally, and that takes out the, uh, the, the it normalizes for the second half weighting of that existing clarity ARR. So you can see the, the, the impact of the Electra acquisition during 2021, and then the pretty consistent growth on a trailing 12 month basis, basis since then. You'll see the recurring um, amounts coming through being the, the orange bars, and then the the uh, non-recurring, uh, which is pretty much all services work, coming through as the, as the dark blue bars there. On the right-hand side, we can see how that translates into group cash EBITDA and, and equally clarity cash EBITDA. As a reminder, when we talk about cash EBITDA, we're talking about traditionally EBITDA less the, less the capitalized R&D spend and less any capitalized leasing spend, which we think is a better reflection of the ongoing costs of our business and, of course, a better proxy for free cash flow. Well, what you can really see there on the, on the chart on the top right-hand side 
is the impact that the clarity and, and growth in the clarity business and growth in the clarity margins it is having on the group level cash EBITDA. With the chart on the bottom there, we can see continued improvements in, in margins, both at a group level and uh, clarity level. And that's despite the currency and inflationary headwinds that have been faced in the pre previous six months. So now just to turn attention to free cash flow generation. And much like our, our, our revenue, our annual free cash flow cycle is significantly H2 weighted. What we've done here is taken the, the cash position at the end of each, uh, each of the most recent uh, six, uh, six month periods. That's in the, the dark blue bars and splitting the bridging that between what is free cash flow and what is other cash flow. For these purposes, we, we've included within free cash flow all of obviously our operating cash flows. We've included all of our capital expenditure. That's both R&D related and, and traditional sort of tangible fixed asset purchases. Included, includes leased leasing payments, but it does exclude tax, um, both payments and receipts and any exceptional uh, payments and receipts. What we can see there in the second half uh, of each year, or sorry, in the first half of each year, is traditionally in the first half, we are winding down cash balances and our free cash flow is actually, uh, actually negative in each first half. But we can also see that negative 2.3 million moving to a negative 1.3 mil million, moving to a negative 1.8 million, moving to in the most recent period, negative 0.7 million, being our best free cash flow performance in, in the first half that we've had uh, since, since the inception of Clarity. And, and that's a trend that we expect to continue. You can also see there the, the very traditional second half weighting, a second half being far stronger um, each, uh, in each, each annual period. And we expect that trend to continue as well. And we expect the free cash flow in the second half of 2023 to be even stronger than that 4.5 million in, the, in 2022. You can also see in the negative 4.7 million uh, other cash flow bar in the second half of 2022, the payment of the first contingent consideration payment for the Electra acquisition, um, which was $4.8 million worth. And uh, just to confirm that we do expect to be making the payment of second and final contingent consideration for Electra, again, of 4.8 million actually in the coming months. Um, the, the end cash balances are all aligned with, expect, with, with our expectations. And at the point of the Electra acquisition, we did put in place a 15 million US dollar revolving debt facility, um, which is expected to be drawn on to a limited extent during Q3, which at the end of Q3 is our traditional low point in the working capital cycle for the year as cash builds up again in, in throughout Q4. Um, and, and that's just a reflection of the fact that so many of our contracts, the vast majority of our recurring contracts are paid in annually in advance. And many of them are either calendar year weighted or were won during Q4. So uh, coinciding with each, each year's anniversary. So just a word on confidence in the full year. Ian's already mentioned this, but we, we've got absolute confidence in, the, in those full year group numbers that are in the market. Um, the contracted visibility that we already have over group revenues of 95%, we've already mentioned. Um, we have a further increased weighting in 2023 of the recognition of our ARR uh, in, in H2. Um, within our ARR, we have a portion um, that is, in fact, the largest portion by some weight that is recognized monthly. But then we have a portion that is recognized annually. That portion that is recognized annually is significantly weighted to the second half. Um, in the prior year, it was 1.3 million weighted to the second half. This year, it's, it's grown to being 1.6 million weighted to the second half. So again, that gives us confidence or in, the, in the full year uh, group revenue numbers, and also our ability to really increase the, the, the uh, earnings in the, in, in the second half. Ian's also already mentioned the Q2 being a significant improvement on, on Q1 and the momentum coming through there. Got a really encouraging pipeline of, of second half opportunities. And uh, we, 
we've, we've already mentioned the really strong momentum we're seeing in, in the US market, uh, in particular on the buy side, and in particular with the uh, w- with the, our new sales leader who, who joined the business two or three months ago. So just moving on now to talk about our market and solutions. Back to you, Ian. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So I guess a little bit of a recap for everyone. Um, really on one slide, um, you know, what do we do for customers? Um, and if we go left to right on this, really the customer challenges um, at the board level within financial services around the customer experience, you're continuing to drive innovation at the product level and service level to differentiate um, the complexity of financial services nowadays. Um, and then specific challenges um, perhaps less so on the, um, you know, g- given the uh, improving interest rate re- regime for the banks, for the, for the sell side, but, but absolutely real concerns around cl- liquidity and cash management. Uh, and then the ongoing challenges of meeting regulatory requirements, whether they're, um, you know, risk driven or, you know, trade and transaction reporting for trade driven uh, transparency. Um, the plethora of, um, of regulations is only building. Um, and, you know, off the back of what we saw in the US uh, with SVB and the like, you know, there's increased momentum around that, you know, and structural changes like the move towards, towards T plus one settlement. Um, you know, so there are ongoing drivers for our customers that are strategic board level issues. And at the day to day basis, they struggle with data and processing that is not always completely accurate. Um, there are manual processes endemic across the industry um, with workarounds, with spreadsheets, user-developed applications that are not transparent, that are prone to error, that have breaks in flow and straight through processing, lack of automation and an increasing complexity that makes unraveling that and um, having confidence in what's going on in the day-to-day processing um, uh, is much reduced. So, You know, that's the world in which we operate. And really, what do we do for customers? We provide, um, you know, the integration of, you know, their digital flows. And we provide as an outcome trusted data and we give them confidence in their day-to-day business processing. Uh, And that's really through the power of our um, clarity platform um, that we've built and developed over the last decade. So let's talk about the platform itself. Um, Conceptually, what do we do for customers? Um, The platform has the capability to acquire data of any shape and form, of any velocity, any volume, um, and then to validate that data, make sense of it, apply business rules across it. Um, But then for the purposes of reconciliation and identifying where there are problems in the data, Um, inconsistencies, data quality problems, error, and sometimes compliance and sometimes fraud-related issues. Um, We need to do a reconciliation, and that's essentially about matching the data and then providing an environment to manage exceptions. Um, And the matching of data is a core strength from the get-go that we started to to develop over 10 years ago and a a real unique in the market in terms of our capabilities. And then downstream from that, managing exceptions, managing groups of exceptions that form part of investigations, and then publishing data to interested parties or um, providing clean, uh, reconciled data to downstream systems. And our platform enables customers to deliver that process on a straight through basis, to optimize it, to document it, to automate it, Um, and ultimately to continuously improve the quality of their data and their processing. So that's conceptually what we do. Um, And if we just move to the next slide, you'll see that in that platform, we have got some real product strengths and some unique capabilities. Um, And it's the combination of those things that enable us to deliver business value back to customers in terms of operating cost takeout, uh, in terms of the management of risk, um, in terms of you know, ensuring that they protect their reputations and deliver good customer service, um, 
and some uniques in the platform that mean that implementation times and the time to value for our customers um, is significantly better than the competition or the alternative of building in-house. You'll see on the list there some of the product capabilities. I, I won't read them all, but essentially we don't care about the kind of data and I'll explain why in a second. We can handle data flowing in batch in real time intraday is increasingly important. We can match any number of feeds of data. Um, and then the platform itself is configurable um, and highly scalable and can operate in the cloud, whether it's our cloud or the customer's cloud. So the combination of strengths means that the business value from working with Gresham is significantly stronger than the alternatives. Um, really just to put into context some of the things that we have done over many years in our platform um, that we would now call AI um, and some of the future opportunities. So if you think of this as what do we do left of the match of data, um, you know, we've built out capabilities to um, use natural language processing to describe the rules that one would use to ingest data. Uh, we re released that about a year ago. Um, we've long been using heuristics uh, and semantic um, inference to drive out match rules for matching of data. Um, you know, the system uses AI to resolve symbologies. So, um, you know, to identify where there are um, different um, standards in the formats of data. And the system inherently learns and suggests match rules as opposed to those be, um, needing to be identified manually and coded manually. Um, and, and so that automatic normalization of the data and the building of the technical schema, the database design that enables the data to be matched, that's all done by the system. And, and so that you know, use of AI from the get-go was, you know, very visionary on our part and, you know, is deeply embedded in our platform. And we built on that, looking at the uses of AI and machine learning on the right-hand side of the match, um, you know, by looking at how the learnings from manual matching patterns can be used, um, you know, to suggest future, an future actions, the use of machine learning to allocate breaks and identify the root causes of breaks, um, using pattern detection to really categorize those breaks and get further intelligence so we can improve. Um, and you know, ultimately where we're heading here is the automatic repair of data um, and the automatic improvement um, you know, of uh, the quality of data. So you know, all of that is a, uh, really an endorsement of the ongoing innovation that our um, technical teams um, have had really, um, you know, since we first started investing in Clarity. Um, so I think on the platform, let's talk now to our other key strength, which is our, which is our team. Sure. So uh, scaling up responsibly is it is something we've we've committed to a number of years ago and, and continue to put high on our agenda. Um, uh, we we have uh, employee senior management team, executive, uh, non-executive, and other stakeholders engaged in all of our uh, responsible business-related and ESG-related programs. We've got a network of ESG champions fully operational um, with both cross-functionally, cross-regionally. Um, we're continuing to monitor the ongoing effectiveness of our hybrid working model. Um, we're continuing to focus on, on climate change. Um, we've got mental health first aiders, a mental health, health first aiders network, fully operational uh, and, and growing across the business. Um, and we do an annual engagement survey every year, um, 60 or 70 questions that are the same each year, um, the results of which are on the right-hand side there. And we've reported on this each year. We're very proud of it, the, the fact that our, our scores have grown year on year. We will do this again next year. But we're particularly proud of the fact that you know, we've had a transformative acquisition throughout those numbers. And, and so often that can see that can 
uh, create for a, a change in people's mood, change in people's feeling towards the company and so on, but it's only improved, uh, which is something we're very proud of. The other piece, the final bullet there, employee churn, we did see raise to about 18 to 20%, so that's a high team level. Um, during the middle of last year, um, during the, uh, the the war on tech talent. But we have seen that reduced back to what we think is normal and very healthy levels, actually, of that those sort of low team type numbers of 13 to 14%. Just talk about ESG a little more concretely. Um, over the last couple of years, we've actually taken part in a few external um, benchmarking type activities and, and surveys. One of those, the results being published here with, with, with Eti Finance, and this is their, their uh, sort of verified ESG scoring. We've had a 52% improvement in ratings from uh, 42, uh, school rating of 42 to 64. We've improved in ratings across all categories, but most importantly for, for us, you know, we're outperforming um, against all of the other 100 plus tech companies that have taken this, uh, the, these surveys across the same period. Um, and we are committed to making further improvements during 2023 as some of our ESG priorities, are, of which are listed there on the right-hand side, are, are delivered upon. I won't read through each of those individually, but ESG generally is something we're committed to, not just the what we have to do from a regulator and reporting standpoint, but equally what's right for us to be doing as good corporate citizens. Yeah, a few thoughts really on the second half um, in terms of our priorities, um, you know, is to continue to tighten our focus around sales and marketing. Um, you know, there are specific opportunities in the market that are regulatory driven. Um, there are specific um, geographies that are really performing strongly. Um, and, um, you know, as a team, we work hard to align our sales focus, our top of funnel activities, our marketing campaigns to really go after um, those active opportunities. So we will continue to tighten our sales and marketing focus um, and really improve the discipline in our go-to-market operations. Um, we'll complete the board transition that we announced as of this morning through the second half of this year. Um, we've got some work around refreshing and um, you know, really putting a real strong identity around clarity. And I think, you know, some of the work that we'll be doing with uh, our new CMO, you'll see come through on that front. It's all about pipeline build. We've got good pipeline for the second half already. Um, and we're very focused now on building, you know, large transaction opportunities and volume at the same time into the pipeline that will serve us well for next year. And of course, we've already got pipeline you know, that gives us good visibility into our um, forecast revenues for next year as well. Um, we'll be soft launching flow. I'll say a few words on that in a minute. You know, but um, operationally on the ground in terms of driving revenue, it's all about landing key accounts. It's about new name wins, and it's about driving incremental revenue from existing customers through stronger account management. And we've got programs in place for all of that. Um, and we've got, you know, opportunities in the second half to land some very interesting, you know, large scale new opportunities as well that will really underpin, um, you know, the rest of the year and into 24. So it's all about making sure that our business plan and go to market is very tight, um, that we invest in the right areas uh, and that we continue to um, drive the innovation story and differentiate ourselves in the market. Um, somewhat of a change of tack, but one of the other things that you will see in the second half um, is uh, the um, launch of our digital banking um, in a, um, project. Um, some of you will have been following that for some time. We, we made some announcements going back three years around uh, a partnership with ANZ Bank, Australian New Zealand banking group, uh, to build out a... Um, capability in digital corporate banking. Um, today is not about sharing the details of that in full. Um, this is a little bit of a teaser to say that um, after three years of work, um, you know, ANZ has gone live with that product. Um, and um, 
they're working with their first customer of that product um, and um, we're working with them towards an announcement um, in a couple of months time so um, we'll be test marketing that in September to make sure we got the messaging right we have a launch plan for October um, and so we would expect to be updating um, our shareholders um, with a mini capital markets day in the October timeframe we're very excited about this um, just to give you a sense of where that really fits if you think about the innovation that's gone on in retail banking um, you know the use of digital um, the use of apis to drive banking services um, there's not been enough of that innovation in corporate banking and that's really where we focused to build something very specific and very exciting so you'll see more of that in the second half as well so i, I guess that's a bit of a wrap in terms of um, overview of us as a company, what we're about, overview of the platform, um, how we felt about the first half and some of the key achievements, um, where we're headed for the second half in terms of, you know, the optimism around our um, full year number and what we're doing also to build out for 24, uh, and then some excitement around where we could be heading longer term. So I think that's a good point just to do a quick summary before um, I head back to you, um, Alessandro, for the questions. Um, so yeah, it, it, um, it, in one slide, really, highly differentiated software. Um, it's proven at scale. We've got some fantastic references. As Tom's, Tom was describing, it's very sticky, very you know recurring revenue. Um, and we're in a, um, a hot market, a growing market. Um, We've built out over the last few years our global operating platform. We build out our franchise through organic and acquisitive growth and got a good track record now of doing both. Continue to invest and we've got a great track record of building really interesting, relevant offerings for our customers. Um, all of that's led to a predictable, profitable and increasingly cash generative business. Um, and I hope today you've got a sense of the kind of upbeat and ambitious team and and we've been delighted to bring some new team members on um in the first half as well um so thank you for that alessandro i just pass back to you and, uh, and clearly we can follow through on some of the questions perfect ian tom thank you very much for your presentation ladies and gentlemen please do continue to submit your questions just by using the q a tab which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen but just while the company take a few moments to review those questions that have been submitted today I'd like to remind you that recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Ian, Tom, as you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And if I could just ask you to read out those questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you at the end. Yeah, definitely. So um, we'll just try and pick, pick these off. And um, I think one of the first questions actually came up when Tom was talking about um, net revenue retention. Um, and I know we published some much more detail around this at the full year, didn't we? We, we, we did. So the question is re with regards to uh, gross revenue retention, in particular for the larger accounts, those bigger than a uh, quarter of a million per annum. And, and equally, could, could we split uh, net revenue retention between uh, the, those larger accounts and the smaller accounts? And as Ian says, on a, on a full year basis, we, we publish some of, some of those. Um, in terms of gro gross retention rates, the most recent time we published that was probably 18 months to a couple of years ago now. And it was low to mid 90s. I think 93% was probably the last time we published it. And, and it really hasn't moved significantly since that point in time. But what I would say is that the, uh, the, the rates on gross retention and the differential between the larger accounts and the small small accounts is not as significant as it is on net retention. Gross retention, I'd say, is, is maybe slightly better on the larger accounts, but not significantly so. If we take that and move that over to the smaller accounts, those less than quarter of a million per annum, the difference is quite significant. So our ability to grow um, those larger accounts and the certainly at the full year, our net revenue, net ARR retention rate for the account bigger than a quarter of a million was at, up at 120%. For the smaller accounts, 
it was starting more at that 100 percent sort of level although wasn't wasn't uh disclosed in, in in particular so there is a bit of a difference there but all in all our our net revenue retention of 103 percent across the base we um, it is, is where we are as at the half year and we we've, we've got a high level of confidence that we can further lift that that, that rate in the second half um Okay, there's, there's a question here um, really around the competition. Um, and um, the, the question was, scroll up. Yeah, so the, the, the question, I'll, re I'll read it out. Which of your competitors do you most respect um, or fear? Uh, well, I, I have to say we respect all of our competition um, because they've all found uh, a way to... Um, build their businesses, um, and one should never be complacent. Um, in terms of the competition that we most fear, I, I would actually say it's the customer themselves because, um, you know, our proposition um, challenges the customer and um, often expects them to think differently about the way that they solve their problems. And, um, you know, quite often we do find that customers are not ready for change. Um, so I think that's probably the main thing that is of concern to us. When we compete, and it's typical for us to go through in, you know, in financial markets, all of our customers operate in a regulated world. They all go through an RFP process, a request for proposals tendering process. They all go through a proof of concept process. We do exceptionally well. Um, and, um, you know, some of that comes back to the, um, the, the list of product strengths that I referred to um, earlier on. So as we progress, um, you know, on a, on a competitive basis, product strength, we are, um, you know, when considered as a whole, by far and away the strongest offering in the market. Um, we're not in all uh, opportunities, and that's comes down to our sales and marketing coverage, which we're building. Um, and, you know, we don't always do the best job of really helping the customer understand the importance of changing the way they think about solving these problems. So I hope that's given you a sense of it. Um, that kind of leads a little bit to um, another question that was um, further up, which was really around um, you know, the use of AI and, you know, does Clarity learn and suggest match rules um, across customers and do other reconciliation products also learn? Um, the use of AI is interesting. I, I think almost all of our competitors have an AI story of some form now. Um, and, you know, across our hosted customers, we see 19 billion transactions um, a year, so we get great learnings across that. Um, in our on-premise customers, they process huge amounts of data um, as well. So we have the opportunity to learn from very substantial um, pool of information. Um, but the, the rubber hits the road, really, not in whether we use AI and how we use AI, but what's the outcome? Um, and consistently, Time and time again, whether it's a proof of concept or in um, live deployments, we get better match rates um, and we get um, you know, better performance on exception management. And that's where really the important thing for our customers. Um, so you know, that's what saves them money and that's really what they want as an outcome from, from the use of AI. Um, now, I've not mentioned our competition in um, going through that explanation but what, what I would leave you with is is really in the marketplace there's only um, four players um, in the market there's smart stream there's FIS as in telematch product uh, and there's duco and we've replaced all of those in customer sites and we've consistently got strong performance and strong results so we respect our competition but we don't fear them. It's all about doing a better job ourselves to get over the power of what we can do for customers. Um, yeah, the, 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 there's also a, a question here 
Uh, do we anticipate being able to increase pricing at least in line with inflation? And, and, and short answer to that is, it, it is yes. Um, slightly more, more flavor on that. All of our uh, clarity contracts allow us to increase uh, increase pricing by an inflationary linked level. There are different flavors of exactly what that means. Um, sometimes it's inflation plus, sometimes it's inflation to a cap, sometimes it, it, it is inflation, sometimes it is a fixed increase year, year on year that we, we pre-agreed regardless of what, what inflation is. But, but in short, yeah, we are confident of being able to, to, to increase yeah, at, at least with, with inflation with inflation levels um, as, as they, they sort of are now. Um, and then we've got another question around flow. What's the structure of the partnership with ANZ on flow and to what extent can flow be cross-sold to existing customers? Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, over the last few years, we have made some announcements um, related to the partnership with ANZ. I, I think to summarize, um, you know, ANZ have uh, funded at cost the uh, product build um, and the IP for that product sits with us. Um, ANZ have obviously provided their business inputs to that um, and uh, ANZ use the technology on a standard commercial license basis. Um, the way that that license is structured um, is with ANZ and with future customers is really around the number of transactions that flow through the software. Um, so we effectively get click fees. Um, and the target market for flow um, is into other transaction banks and certain financial market um, segments. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about that in the uh, mini capital markets day. So I'd like to reserve um, uh, some detail on that, uh, in part because it's still um, under NDA with um, with our partners. Um, you know, but there is, um, you know, we, we are going after um, financial services customers, um, and undoubtedly some of our existing clients in different parts of their organisation um, will have an interest in what we're doing. So, you know, we we absolutely will be able to leverage you know, our reputation for doing good things in financial services for, for the future sale of this. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. May I say goodnight? Um, Can I get your water? <laughs> yes, thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, um, go on. Yeah, so... We have a question with regards to UK market correctly valuing Gresham's equity um, and what's our preferred metric. Um, correctly valuing probably isn't us, for us to answer, really. Um, obviously, the market <laughs> they are, are at the moment is, is probably not the best indication um, and, and, uh, as to uh, deem what is correct and what, what isn't. Um, but in terms of preferred metrics, if, if we look at the way that a lot of the analysts are, are, metri are, are measuring us, it, it's certainly on a some of the parts type basis. So looking at the clarity business as a, as a standalone, um, looking at the cash that is generating over a multi-year period, taking into account ARR as well and, and, and growth rates. And I think there's also been, it's fair to say, there's been a shift over the last year, couple of years with how, how US markets equally um, value uh, technology businesses, in particular growth bonds. Um, so, um, the, you know, I have some personal views as, as well, of course, on that, but uh, probably not, not really one for us to, to answer any more than that. Um, no, there's another question really directionally uh, in terms of forecast expectations for flow. And, and again, I don't think now is the appropriate time to do that, except to say that we feel that flow has the potential to be a substantial business in its own right, um, you know, of a scale of, of clarity and, you know, potential beyond that. It's in an interesting space and, you know, look forward to, to sharing more about that when we come around to October. Um, there's a question around 
uh, whether we would target multinationals, uh, such as, you know, large global multinationals, Unilever as an example in the question. Um, and, and I assume that that's really around our clarity uh, proposition. We do have some multinationals that leverage our technology. Um, and, you know, you'll have seen one or two on the logo list, actually. Um, it's not our priority segment, um, you know, but there are some global multinationals that have, you know, large scale uh, reconciliation oriented challenges or, um, you know, data connectivity oriented challenges, treasury related challenges, where our technology could play strongly, um, but it doesn't always play well to our domain knowledge and, um, you know, our reference base. And there's so much for us to run at in financial services. The core, core market for us in financial markets, capital markets, um, you know, is approaching three quarters of a billion dollars. So we really want to capture that opportunity. Um, and, um, you know, that's um, really where we're directing our current sales efforts. Um, yeah, there's a question just just reading it out really directionally around market share um, between the various um, players in what I assume from the question is, again, is that core um, reconciliation matching space um, in terms of uh, third party product and also in house and user developed. And yeah, so the third party product market, you know, growing half a billion to um, three quarters of a billion market. Um, there is a structural shift going on. Um, you know, those legacy vendors, um, you know, will be replaced over time. And, and really that's, um, you know, that's what we, we're focused on going after. Um, the market is growing steadily. There's not good um, market research data on this. Um, you know, we have pulled together data from various third party surveys over the years and our own market intelligence. Um, you know, and I think we're in the right ballpark, um, but that particular space is not well covered by any of the leading analysts, you know, the gardeners of this world. Um, so, um, but yeah, we, we, we see, you know, we, we're out, we're active in the market. Um, you know, we're targeting 500 banks around the world. You know, a couple of thousand investment managers. We've got a good good feel for what's going on, and there is a shift of spend happening from those legacy vendors towards modern solutions, um, and we'll see that happening over the next three to five year period. So that's the prize for us. Um, Alessandro, I think we've covered pretty much the gist of all of the questions that I can see on the screen. Yes, Ian, to you. Yeah, Ian, Tom, thank you very much for that. I think you actually addressed all those questions from investors. And of course, the company will review all the questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the Investor Meet company platform. But just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you both, Ian, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yeah, thank you, Alessandro, for hosting today. Um, yeah, and I'd encourage everyone, um, you know, take a look back at the full year report because there's a lot more detail around some of the, the bigger themes in there as well. Um, but yeah, just to really wrap up on, on where we stand. So, you know, first half, we're, we're on track. We're in line with our full year um, uh, business plans. We've got 95% of group revenues um, already covered in terms of being contracted, highly visible. Uh, pipeline's looking pretty good. Team's very upbeat. We're seeing good momentum uh, in certain key markets that are important to us, most notably the US. Um, and, excuse me, <coughs> um, you know, we're in a space that's got strong uh, tailwinds, um, you know, financial markets. Um, you know, we saw a couple of months where things slowed, but actually there's strong momentum we're seeing in our customer base. Um, and the pipeline's building steadily. So we're feeling pretty upbeat about it. Um, you know, really appreciate your interest in us. And, and for those of you that are holders, thank you for your support. We look forward to updating you as the quarter Q3 progresses. Perfect. Ian, Tom, thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback 
In order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations, this will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Gresham Technologies PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.